heaven thank you for this day that we've been able to worship you this morning and that we come together tonight to continue our worship and time of study father we pray that you be with us as we are looking to begin in person uh, worship services again coming up the next few weeks we just pray that you keep everybody safe and healthy and be with the elders as they are making these final decisions to keep everybody safe and healthy while we can come together and worship you. Father, we pray that you be with us through the rest of this service, be with our singing, and with the message that has been prepared. Let it come into each of our hearts, and let us be able to take it out into our daily lives and show your love to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a land could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men, counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit, keep on to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. 
Good evening. Thank you for being here with us again this evening as we conclude our look at the Christian virtues. Several years ago, there was a fad in preaching that said that you could not use a verse or just a, a few verses to make a point. Whenever you made a reference to any part of the scripture, you had to always present it in its historical, cultural, social, literary setting. And if you didn't do that, then you were not treating it properly. I'm glad that's no longer true because there's absolutely no, no scriptural support for that. Uh, Jesus at one point simply said, remember Lot's wife. And as we've mentioned, when it, the, the program that I use for the scriptures puts quotations from the Old Testament all in all caps. And I'm sure you've noticed how frequently that happens, that a passage that we're using has part of it in all caps because Peter and, and Paul are simply taking part of an Old Testament uh, passage and making a point with that. The Hebrew writer does it quite frequently. Uh, we'll just mention something from the quote, something from the Old Testament. He even makes that very grave error of sometimes saying it is written somewhere. And imagine a preacher trying to get away with saying it's written somewhere, but the Hebrew writer does it. And that was probably a transcript of an early sermon or sermons. And so it's not wrong to take part of a a chapter, a number of verses, or even a verse to make a point, as long as the point is honest and consistent with what that verse is saying. And so it is legitimate for us to take that list of virtues in Second Peter chapter 1 and use those to apply to our life. But often we miss a greater point if we just do that, and there's something even bigger for us if we'll just take the time to look at the greater context I don't want to leave those those three verses from Second Peter chapter one without looking at them in their entire context in Second Peter chapter one. And so if you do have your Bibles, you might want to turn there to Second Peter chapter one so that you can follow along with us. In verses two through four, Paul says, Grace and peace be multiplied. He says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And these are the words that precede that list of Christian virtues in verses 2 through 4. And then the Christian virtues begin in verse 5. Peter, has, Peter here says, grace and peace be multiplied. Uh, grace and peace is sometimes used as, as a simple greeting in a letter. Peter does it in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, where he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. Paul also does that in Romans chapter 1 and verse 7 where he says to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes then that statement is just part of a, of a blessing at the beginning of a letter. But sometimes it, it, it's, there's a little bit more to that. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, Peter says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of, uh, day of eternity. Amen. And we'll take another look at this passage in just a second. 
But notice here, here that he goes a little, little bit farther in, in depth about growing in grace. And here he associates it with knowledge. And he contrasts it with falling into error and being carried away by unprincipled men. He says there that grace and peace be multiplied in the knowledge of God and Jesus. And so our grace is associated with knowledge. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20, Peter talks about those who have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but who are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. We just might point out here a side note that uh, as we read through these things, that no way do any of these passages support the idea of Calvinistic predestination. Calvinistic predestination says that God has chosen beforehand who will be saved and who will not be saved. There is nothing we can do to, to affect our salvation, either to be saved or to be lost, because once you're saved, you're always saved, and there's nothing we can do about it. There is nothing in the scripture that even, remote, even remotely supports Calvinistic predestination. But if there were no other verses in the Bible that refute that, that unsound doctrine, this one verse alone would do that. They suggest that if a person falls away, they never were saved in the first place. And that's not what this verse says. Go back and read this verse again. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, these are people who are saved because Peter says they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But then they do fall away. He says they are again entangled in them and are overcome. And in fact, the last state has become worse for them than the first. If they never were saved in the first place, then the second state could be no worse than the first. And so as we go through these passages, just keep in the back of your mind that nowhere do they support the idea of Calvinistic predestination. And Peter says grace and peace be multiplied in the knowledge of God and Jesus. In the next chapter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 18, we read that just a little bit earlier, but he says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. We grow in grace when we have the knowledge of God in Jesus. He says that his divine power has granted us everything. His divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life, everything pertaining to godliness. And so is there anything that we need that he has not given us, that he has granted us, has not granted us? He has granted us everything pertaining to life. He has granted us everything pertaining to godliness. God has given us everything that we need for anything important. He does that through the true knowledge. You'll remember that the, the Greek word for, for knowledge is uh, eunosos, and that sometimes there's a prefix added, epi, and epi eunosos is a higher knowledge, a true knowledge, and sometimes the, the New American Standard translates epi eunosos as true knowledge. Your epiderm is the upper layer of your, scar, of your skin, and so epi means above, and there is something above knowledge, and that is epi-knowledge, true knowledge. And God's divine power has granted everything through true knowledge because he has called us by his own glory and excellence. He has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. Have you ever th thought about the promises that God makes to us and how magnificent those are? And Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, refers to one of his promises, and in the first case, it is his promise to destroy the world. And at first glance, that doesn't sound like a very good promise. To Christians, though, it is a wonderful promise that there will be a day when this world will end and then eternity will begin in heaven with God and Jesus. That's a beautiful thing. And so Peter is just talking about those who mock and say God will not come. And he hadn't come yet and Jesus hadn't come yet and so it's not going to happen. But Peter points out in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 that the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. A few verses later, he says, But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And so one promise is that he will destroy the world, but part of that promise is that we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth. And isn't that a glorious promise? In Titus chapter 1, Beginning in verse 1, 
Paul identifies himself as a bondservant of God and an apostle of Christ Jesus for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness in the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. And here again the promise is that of eternal life. God promised eternal life long ago and it adds that God cannot lie. If God makes us a promise he cannot lie. He made that manifest through Jesus through the proclamation of the gospel. And so God made the promise long ago that we would have eternal life but that was fulfilled through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29, Paul talks about a promise that we have, that if we belong to Christ, then we are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. God has promised that we can be co-heirs of Abraham. The promises that God made to Abraham are passed down to us if we belong to Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 14, we see how magnificent this promise truly is. For all who have been led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again. But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. What a magnificent promise that we can be fellow heirs with Christ. We can be brothers of Christ and sons of God. And God promises that that's, that's true. In Galatians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 18, it says, And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me says the Lord Almighty. And this is one of those unfortunate chapter breaks because the last verse of chapter 6 really is tied into the first verse of chapter 7 because that first verse of chapter 7 begins with therefore. And therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, Jason and I have talked uh, more than once on Sunday morning about the the theme of the book of Hebrews, and that is better, that Jesus is better than the angels, Jesus is better than Moses. You'll remember that the, the problem was that as the, as the days and the years passed, New Testament Christians were being tempted to go back into Judaism, back into their old way, following the old law. And the argument of Hebrews is that why would you give up the better for the worse? Why would you give up Jesus for Moses when Jesus is better? Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than Moses. It says that the heavenly tabernacle is better than the earthly one. And in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, the Hebrew writer says that he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. We have all those promises of the Old Testament, but in addition, we have things that are even better the ministry of Jesus is better than any in the Old Testament. He is the mediator of a covenant, the new covenant, which is better than the old covenant. And the promises that we have in the new covenant are so much better than those in the old. He says that he has granted to us, Paul says that he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them we might become partakers of the divine nature. And that's what we saw earlier, that the promise is that we can become fellow heirs with Christ. He says that we do that by having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. In Romans chapter 6, Paul points out that we are buried with Jesus to, to be raised to walk a new life when we are buried in baptism and we come out of the waters of baptism to walk that new life. Beginning in verse 12 of, of Romans chapter 6, Paul advises, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts, and do not go on presenting the members of your body as sin, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall no longer be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, 
you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And so we have escaped those things uh, that are in the world, the corruption that is in the world by its lusts. And then Peter lists those Christian virtues in verses 5, 6, and 7. After that, in verse 8, he picks up and says that if these qualities, he says in verse 8, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If those virtues, if, there's, if those qualities are in us and increasing, there are certain results. If these qualities are yours, each one of us needs to have a faith that is our own. We cannot carry our parents' faith, our grandparents' faith, or anybody else's faith. That does not mean that the faith that we have is not the same, and we don't need to confuse those two. Uh, we know from Jude that the faith was once for all delivered, and so the faith that I have, if my parents were following the true faith, I need to follow that same faith. And if my grandparents were following the true faith, I need to follow that same faith. But that faith needs to become part of me. It needs to be mine. And so these qualities, these Christian virtues, need to be mine. That does not mean that I need to change worship. I need to change what the Bible teaches. I don't need to change doctrine. That simply means that it needs to be mine. It needs to become part of me. These qualities need to be mine. You know, that's not enough, though. That list of Christian virtues in Second Peter chapter 1 isn't a straight line. It's a spiral because I think when you get to the end, he says they need to be increasing. And so you go back to the first and you start over again. Those qualities need to be in us, but they need to be increasing. If they are increasing and if they are ours, then they render us neither useless nor unfruitful. The opposite of that is true, that if they are not ours and if they are not increasing, uh, then we are useless and we are unfruitful. But if they are ours and they are increasing, we are neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge. And here again is that epionosco, the true knowledge, epionosis. In verse 9, Peter goes on to say that those who lack these qualities, he says, he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. If we lack these qualities, it's because we are blind or we are short-sighted. On Sunday mornings, Jason has been going through the book of John and, and pointing out the important elements in the book of John. And John has some very important themes that he follows. Uh, he follows the, the theme of love that's important to John, of course. He talks about knowledge and truth and how that knowledge of the truth affects our salvation. One of the themes that follows throughout not only the Gospel of John, but the Epistles of John, is the conflict between light and dark. It begins in John chapter 1 and verse 5, where John says that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And Jesus picks up on that theme in John chapter 3 and verse 19, where he says, And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds are evil. In John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. And then again in John chapter 12, verse 35, Jesus says, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, that darkness may not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. A few verses later, he says, I have come as light into the world, that everyone who believes in me may not remain in darkness. And John continues that theme in his epistles. In 1 John chapter 1, he says, And this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, 
and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In the second chapter of 1 John, beginning in verse 5, On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And John is not the only one who follows this theme of the contrast between light and dark. Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 and 5 says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. And Peter also follows that theme in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, where he tells us that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. If we lack these qualities, if they're not in us and growing in us, then we are blind or short-sighted. We have forgotten the purification from our former sins. Can you imagine the frustration of Paul who spent so much time spreading the gospel and converting people to find that they are only going back to their old way of life? And so imagine his frustration in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6 when he says, For I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. They had forgotten their purification from their former sins. Back in 2 Peter chapter 1, Paul continue, or Peter continues his discussion with the word therefore. He says in verses 10 through 15, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. And I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you may be able to call these things to mind. Peter says, therefore, be all the more diligent. Would we describe our Christian life as diligent as our spiritual life as diligent? And even if it is, Peter says, we need to be more diligent. We need to be more diligent about his calling. How are we called? How do we receive a calling? And Paul answers that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. And it was for this that he, called, that he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. How does God call us? He calls, it through, calls us through the gospel, through the New Testament, through the scriptures. And we need to be more diligent about his choosing us. And again, God does not choose us in a predestination way. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. God chose those who would obey the gospel to receive a certain benefit, a certain outcome. He also chose the Gentiles to become fellow heirs with the Jews. Those were the things that he chose before the foundation of the world. God did not choose individuals and say, you're going to heaven and you're going to hell and there's nothing you can do about it. But we need to be all the more diligent about his calling and about his choosing. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, 
that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so there Peter says that we are a chosen race and that God has called us. We need to be all the more diligent so that the interest to the kingdom will be abundantly supplied. God supplies things to us abundantly. Paul says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? We should never underestimate the rich and abundant way that God provides thing, things. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 7, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. And notice that Paul does not tell Timothy that it is a sin to be rich. It's just a danger for rich people that they might become easily conceited or that they might fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. But they can still fix their, their hope on God. Because God has given us everything to enjoy. God supplies us with all things to enjoy. So it's not wrong to be rich. It is wrong to fix our hope on earthly things and not on God. And then Paul says that I shall also, I will always be ready to remind you. Although you already know, there never comes a point when we say, eh, you've told us enough, we've learned enough. We don't need to hear this anymore. Paul says, I want to remind you, even though you already know these things, and although you have been established in the truth. He says, I want to stir you up in verses 13 and 14, because that's the right thing to do. It is the right thing for a gospel preacher sometimes to stir us up, to get us going, to encourage us, to edify us, to build us up. And Peter says he does that by way of reminder. It's important to Peter because he knows that the, laying, that the laying aside of his life is imminent. And he says, I will also be diligent. Now, he's just told us to be diligent in certain things. He says, I'm going to be diligent too. You be diligent about certain things, and I'm also going to be diligent. Because after my departure, I know certain things are going to happen. This was something that was important to uh, Paul also. In Acts chapter 20, Paul calls the elders from Ephesus to meet him in Miletus. Notice the warning that he gives them in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Peter is concerned about what will happen after he is gone, and Paul here is, is worried about what's going to happen after he is gone. And Peter wants to make sure that they will be able to call these things to mind. And that was also what Paul was concerned about in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, when he told Timothy, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. It's very important to us that there will always be someone around to call these things to mind, to point us to the scriptures, to direct us to the scriptures, to guide us in the scriptures. And so we need to be diligent because after we're gone, the people left behind need to be able to call those things to mind also. And then in the final verses of that chapter, Peter points out that they had not followed cleverly design, uh, devised tales. He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, 
but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Peter says that we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power of our Lord and when we made known to you the coming of our Lord. But we were eyewitnesses. We are reporting to you things that we saw. We didn't follow cleverly devised tales. We did not make things up as we went along. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, Peter says. He he reminds us of that time on the mountain when Peter, James, and John were there and Jesus was transfigured. And Peter says, we heard the utterance. And so he says, we have the prophetic word made more sure. And you do well to pay attention. Pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. And we get back to that contrast between light and dark. Until the day dawns and the morning star arises. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 8, John says, On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Peter says, We did not follow cleverly devised tales. We have the prophetic word made more sure, and you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. He says that we did not follow cleverly devised tales. And know this first of all, be convinced that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. You've probably heard people say, you have your interpretation and I have mine. And that may be true, but one of them is false because there is only one interpretation and that is the one that's intended by the Holy Spirit. No prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. Men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. There is no better definition of inspiration than in this passage in Peter. As we conclude this thought and, and wrap up our, our thought about the Christian virtues, I take time to read that whole chapter, Second Peter chapter 1, and see what those Christian virtues mean in their context. But let's close with Second Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom, wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own description. We need to take a look at the scriptures, and we need to obey the scriptures, we need to understand the scriptures, we need to apply the scriptures to our own lives and if we don't do that if we distort them we are among the un untaught and the unstable and we will not practice the christian virtues please always remember that the gospel invitation is open to you at any time if you would like to open your bible and take a look at what it says about salvation and about your life and about your relationship with god please let us know we will be happy to sit down with you and open your Bible and take a look at it with you. If you have done that and you are convinced and, and convicted of the fact that you need to be buried with Jesus in baptism and join him in his death, burial, and resurrection so that you can be raised to walk a new life, please contact us. We can do that. Uh, you don't want to put it off. It is critical for your salvation. If you have obeyed the gospel and you have fallen behind, perhaps you have not allowed these Christian virtues to be part of your life. You want to do that. You want to make them you and you want to make them part of your life and you want them to be increasing in you, but you need help. Let us know and we'll sit down and pray with you or pray for you and do whatever we can to join hands with you as you walk the Christian life. And let's close with a prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Christian virtues that you have given us, and we pray that we will look at those and make those part of our life. We pray that we will also understand that they need to be increasing in our lives, that we should never be satisfied with the status quo and say we've done enough, we've, we've uh, grown as much as we need to, and we can just coast on in from here. Please help us to be convicted of the fact that we need to be growing and increasing. We pray that you be with those who are suffering health-wise, those who are suffering economically, those who are suffering emotionally. And we pray that you will comfort them and use us in, a, in whatever way possible to, 
to share your comfort with them. We pray that you will be those who are working in difficult areas to spread the gospel, that, that you will watch over them and bless them, and that your word will bear fruit. We pray that your word will bear fruit in all the world, just as you have promised. We pray that you'll be with us and watch over us and guide us, that you will forgive us of our sins and give us that home in heaven with you someday. In Jesus' name, amen.